and the creative spirit. And we have the tool that built our way of life, productivity. America, with only 6% of the world's population, produces over 40% of the world's goods. How can such a small percentage of the world's people produce so much? 1940, the average American worker had four horsepower of electrical energy, or the equivalent of nearly 70 invisible workers at his command. By 1950, 10 short years later, this number had more than doubled. There were on the job with him over 150 unseen workers. And the ranks of these invisible battalions keep growing. With this productivity, we can add to our freedoms and defend them. We must keep building our productivity to strengthen freedom at home and halt the tyranny abroad. If we are now able to multiply the efforts of every workman 150 times with only eight horsepower of electric power, why not still more horsepower? Why not 200, 300, 500 invisible workers on the job? crisis now and will be for some time to come. All we can do is face it, recognize it, and meet the challenges it poses. Ours is a crisis characterized by shortages of all kinds. We have at present an absolute shortage of natural gas. We cannot produce as much as we can use, as we are equipped to use in our homes and our factories. This situation is destined to continue. Our industrial progress and economic growth was fired by what many seem to look on as endless energy. But warning signs were there. Until 1950, the United States could supply the energy needed. But in less than 25 years, we found ourselves in trouble. Each year, we used 5% more, doubling our demand every 12 to 14 years. Coal production stayed at 1940s levels. Crude oil production dropped. In 1968, natural gas consumption began exceeding new discoveries. Oil companies during this period were encouraged to get oil and gas from other countries. By 1970, we imported one-third of our oil and gas, relying on others to meet new needs. Then, in 1973, the big Middle East producers cut off oil shipments to major consuming countries. When the embargo was lifted, the price of foreign oil had jumped from three to $12 a barrel, four times higher than before. More than $20 billion left the United States. One out of every seven gallons of oil we'd been using to power our homes, our cars, our businesses, and our schools just wasn't there anymore. At the height of the embargo, half a million people were thrown out of work. Products we manufactured and sold dropped from 10 to $20 billion in value. We were caught by surprise with a crisis that could recur and recur unless the entire country recognized the dangers of a quite real energy shortage. And out of the embargo was born Project Independence, a launching pad from which would evolve this country's first national energy policy. The first three goals are largely the job of government and industry. The fourth, conservation is up to all of us. The blueprint was designed to make the United States energy self-sufficient by 1985. That is, we would import some oil, but would not be so dependent on other countries. But in a nation where cheap fuel is considered a birthright, it's a price that hurts. In Houston, Texas, oil capital of the United States, gargantuan SUVs and pickup trucks far outnumber four-cylinder passenger cars. 
it's outrageous. It, it really is. Yeah, well, I need a big car. I'm, I'm a big man, so I need a big car. I didn't got so mad at you. Ever got so mad at something you just came and talk on it no more? Sixty bucks just to fill a little jet ski like this up. And drive it around for the day. That's it. Yep. It's out of control. Wait, what do I got to do over here? You any idea why it's so hard? Uh, no, not really. To be honest with you, I think it's uh, ridiculous. There's plenty of spots in the U.S. where we can drill and get our own oil instead of getting oil from overseas. And it's uh, it's bullshit. United States land-based production peaked way back in 1972. The discovery of Alaska's giant Prudhoe Bay field reversed the decline briefly. But despite all America's technology, the curve has proceeded downwards. Country after country has followed a similar path. Russia, Venezuela, Indonesia. According to Chevron, in 33 of the world's 48 most important oil producing countries, production has already peaked. Australia's peak crude oil production was passed in 2000. Campbell's gloomy prediction is that peak global production of cheap conventional oil may have already passed. If oil from deep water and the polar regions and liquids derived from gas are added, production will peak soon after 2010. As Dr. Campbell tells audiences in a lecture he delivers all over Europe, as discovery has trended down in the past 50 years, consumption has kept on rising. The last year in which the world discovered more new oil than it used was 1981. If you're an optimist, and I consider myself an optimist, um, uh, then you want to think that everything's going to be fine. I want to think things are, are going to be fine. But if you're a realist and you think about the risks of being wrong, the downsides are enormous. If we get this wrong, we are all in very serious trouble. What sort of trouble? Well, if you look at what happened in 1973 and 1979, um, we had recessions, we had uh, large unemployment, we had inflation, uh, we had very serious economic problems, and those were brief interruptions. The peaking of world oil production will not be brief. So what are your customers having to pay per day? Well, they're, they have to pay for... Uh for uh, our increased investment. Uh, day rates will range from uh, $300,000 to $600,000 per day. While we can drill off West Africa and they have significant reserves, or Brazil, or the deep water U.S. Gulf, they're just going to be replacing what we're currently consuming. But that's just treading water. That assumes that we're not increasing consumption. I want to be clear, ladies and gentlemen, we have more than sufficient reserves to increase production capacity and are committed to do so in line with demand growth. We believe that Saudi Arabia could produce at substantially higher levels for the next 50 years. Now that's absolute rubbish. You, you, you cannot possibly believe such statements. It's absolutely beyond belief. Basically what they're asking us to do is to trust them. And frankly on something that's the lifeblood of our civilization and the way we live to trust somebody who won't allow any audits uh, is extremely risky I personally uh, don't believe the numbers that are out there I think His Excellency the Minister of Petroleum has said that we will meet demand as it materializes